The cloud, another really important, critical indeed, component of what information systems is about and why information systems provides a platform for businesses to get things done in new, exciting, innovative, cost-saving ways. And a lot of this comes down, at least, at least to start with, comes down to this notion of elastic demand. The cloud allows a company to not have to build a huge data center just to take care of the one or two days a year when they have the most demand. So what's their most, uh, what's the busiest shopping day of the year? Now most of you know it's Black Friday. And the black, by the way, in Friday is um, because up until that point, most retailers have been running in the red, as in they've been losing money. And Black Friday, the word black, is when they go from being in the red and into the black and actually making money. So that's the Friday after Thanksgiving, so usually the last Friday in November. Now, when I was uh, working with KPMG as an information systems consultant, one of my major clients was Visa. And we did a lot of work with Visa on backup and data security and all the controls of the risks around their data and information. And one of the things that happened at Visa was between the Wednesday before Black Friday and basically January 1st, you could not touch the Visa system. They did not want anyone at all touching anything to do with their system because they needed to make sure credit cards could process. One thing I like to do is this. So in those five seconds, Visa processed about $100 million. They process almost $20 million a second, which is just a phenomenal amount. So they have really good information systems and they don't want to mess them up. And so elastic demand is this notion that you need to, if you're an online retailer, you need to take care of your peaks. And so the biggest peak in online retailing is Cyber Monday, which comes after the weekend, after Black Friday. And so one of the biggest players these days in cloud computing happens to be Amazon, and it started because they, as an online retailer, needed to get all the infrastructure in place, all the data center uh, space in place to handle Cyber Monday. Then, of course, they spent all that money, they got all that up and running, and then uh, you can imagine it's uh, January 2nd, they're back in the, you know, the management office and they're like, whoa, what are we going to do with all this space we have uh, in our data centers that no one's using? And thankfully, and honestly, it's been going around since the advent of computers, has been this notion that, hey, we should be able to just, you know, share out the space that we have that's not being used. So Amazon started A3 and um, their... Uh, cloud, Amazon Web Services, their ability to use their services um, over the internet. And so that started this notion of cloud computing. And certainly Amazon is a really great provider of cloud computing services. And what it does is for a business like mine, if I need to get something done, I can sign a contract with Amazon Web Services. And what it does is it allows me to just pay for the computing technology and power that I need and if I need more, I just pay more. And if I need less, I pay less. And that's elasticity right there. It's your ability to just pay for what you use. As Nick Carr said, it's just like electricity. We flip a switch, we pay for the electricity, we flip it off, we stop paying for the electricity. Now, many of you may not have looked too closely at your electricity bills, but there are actually two components in there. And one is kind of a flat fee for the lines and stuff that have to be in place to make this happen. And then one is for the actual delivery of electricity that you use. And so most contracts with these web services are exactly the same. There's some flat fee that just allows you to connect and then there's some variability, the elastic portion. So there you go, that's cloud services. And so it allows you to start new things with low capital. It allows you the flexibility to add more, and if things aren't working out, you stop paying. So it gives you the flexibility to try something out, back out of that if it doesn't work. 
And then another thing I like about cloud services, and we can kind of see from our infrastructure section, if you watch the videos on Facebook and Google, and you must do that, you really should, you can see that they're really concerned about backup, continuity, and security. And think about that. Think about the University of Montana. How many people do you think we have at the University of Montana running security of our operations, our IT operations? I'll let you take a second to think about that. And if you guessed one person, then you are close, but you overestimated how many people we have here. Because honestly, we probably do have one person, but they don't work 24 seven. They work eight to five, Monday through Friday. Now think about it. If you're at Amazon Web Services Data Center, how many people do you think they have running security? Yeah, probably hundreds, maybe even a thousand, 24 seven as well. And not to take it away from whoever does the security at the University of Montana, but my guess is these are high-end security professionals. They have got all the certified information systems technology training that you can possibly get. They are what's called best of breed. And so what I love about going with these cloud service providers at least the kind of likes of Facebook or Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Adobe um, or Oracle is that you are using the world's best. You are getting the world's best security and you're getting the world's best continuity. You know, if something goes down at the University of Montana, they have, probably have one or two people who have to go and figure out what the problem is. Think back to those Facebook and Google videos. Um, they have systems in place to know when something's going to fail and they fix it before it fails. And even if it fails, there's 2,000 other drives that can handle the issue before we have a problem. They have these enormous electric uh, diesel generators to make sure things are running should the power go out. Yeah, that's just not happening at the University of Montana. So there's tons of upside to using these cloud providers. But we do need to consider the downsides because there are some. One is you are dependent on the vendor. What happens if you go with a vendor and they go out of business? You kind of messed up. All your data may go away. Potentially worse, at least the way I look at things, is what if your vendor gets bought? Who owns Amazon? Because your data has been stored on Amazon hard drives. And sure enough, you do have you know, a contract that says your data is your data. But at the end of the day, Amazon does have access to that data, right? Now, they've said they won't touch it, but is that true? What if the Chinese government decided to completely buy all the stock of Amazon? Now, I think that would get blocked by the American regulators in the Congress. But what if they did or could? They could have access to everyone's data. Did you know, for instance, that the CIA has a $600 million contract with Amazon to provide cloud services. Does that mean the CIA also paid for access to everyone's data on those servers or the servers right next to the CIA data? I don't know, something to think about. There's also federal regulations that sometimes prevent places from having their stuff on cloud computing. So for instance, here at the University of Montana, we are regulated by federal law, the FERPA, FERPA, which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And it's a little unclear, but the way we've interpreted in a lot of universities is that we are not allowed to upload our data to Amazon's servers or to Microsoft servers, because that means we've pushed it outside, uh, outside our institutional boundaries. Now, I think FERPA needs to be changed to allow us to move our data and information to a really safe location rather than a less than safe location here at the University of Montana. But nonetheless, one of the issues as a company or as an organization you have to think about is are there any federal or any laws that might prevent you from moving stuff into or off-site into a data center? So there's a ton of upside and there's a bunch of downside and all these issues are things that management information systems are going to be working with business people around the decisions about what are the risks and how can we control those risks. That's exactly what information systems majors do. 
we don't go into the data centers and change out the hard drives. What we make sure is that backups have been done well. We make sure that Facebook has the procedures in place so that backups are done properly and regularly. So that's what an information systems major does. They have to understand the technology component, the risk and controls, and they have to understand the business reasons for controlling risk and why you would do that. And so that's why information systems majors get paid so much, is they have to understand technology and business and how those two things overlap. And I found it a very exciting field. For one, cloud computing has only been around for six, seven years, and I'm sure it's going to change. And what I find interesting is you need to learn how to learn, as Tom Friedman said, because cloud computing is not going to be around forever. It's going to evolve, and we as information systems majors need to understand why it's evolving, what the risks and controls are of that evolution, how is backup, how's availability, how is storage, how is security. All of those things are going to be perennial, but the way they get done is going to change. And I find that fabulously interesting, and I hope you do too.